Hello, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. This is the third video on biochemistry questions. In the first video, we had 10 biochemistry questions, then five, and here another five biochemistry questions with answers. Let's go. As always, please bring a pen and paper and let's see how many of these you will answer correctly. Please refer to my playlist titled MCAT questions for more questions and answers. For more non-MCAT questions, go to my playlist titled vignettes. Question 16, because the previous 15 were in previous videos. Peptide bond formation is an example of blank reaction, whereas peptide bond breakdown is an example of blank reaction. Is it oxidation and then reduction or reduction and then oxidation or is it condensation hydrolysis or double replacement combustion? Please pause and try to answer this yourself. Remember, if you want to make peptide bonds, this is condensation. What does condensation mean? It means that water is leaving the chat and then we're combining two doofuses together. The opposite is peptide bond breakdown. This is done by hydrolysis, not by removing water, but by adding water. And this water will help us break down bonds by hydrolytic enzymes. Remember that hydro means water, lytic from lysis means breakdown. Let's try to make a peptide bond. Here is an amino acid, here is an amino acid. You combine them together while water is leaving the chat. You take the OH from one doofus and H from the other doofus. H plus OH will give you H2O. Water is leaving the chat. This is a condensation, also known as dehydration reaction. How about breaking down the peptide bonds in the process of digestion? Well, it doesn't have to be protein, by the way. Whether you're digesting proteins, peptide bond breakdown, or digesting lipids or carbohydrates, etc., digestion is always hydrolysis by enzymes collectively known as hydrolases. Look at the protease, pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, all of these are hydrolases. Dipeptidase, carboxypeptidase, all of these are hydrolases. What do you mean? I add water, hydro, to break down bond, lysis. Water is entering into the chat to break down this peptide bond. Hashtag hydrolysis. There you go. Two amino acids bound together by peptide bond. So here's a peptide chain. You add water to break down the peptide bond. This is called hydrolysis. And this is what digestion is all about. The enzyme amino peptidase will take care of this part. And the carboxy peptidase will take care of this part. Amino group versus carboxyl group. So what do you think the answer is? Peptide bond formation is an example of condensation, whereas peptide bond breakdown is an example of hydrolysis, which makes choice C the correct answer. Next, which of the following letters depicts the rate-limiting enzyme for ketone bodies formation? What do you think? Is it enzyme A, B, C, or D? Please pause and let me know. Well, the rate-limiting enzyme in ketogenesis is HMG-CoA synthase. If I want to synthesize HMG-CoA, it means that it will come before HMG-CoA. So the correct answer here is B. Enzyme B represents HMG-CoA synthase, which is the key rate-limiting step in ketogenesis or ketone body formation. But what if the question was, which of the following is the key rate-limiting enzyme for cholesterol synthesis? That would have been HMG-CoA reductase. But back to ketogenesis, all right? Here I have my ketone bodies. What are the ketone bodies? You cannot forget these. Acetone, acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid. That's why if I have too much of these, I get ketoacidosis. Next, which of the following substances is a high energy intermediate in glycolysis that can be utilized in substrate level phosphorylation? Pause and try to enter this. Let me first remind you that there is a big difference between substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation takes place in the cytosol, but oxidative phosphorylation happens in the mitochondrion. There are more differences between the two, and please refer back to my videos on glycolysis to learn more. You'll find my video on glycolysis and the TCA cycle, electron transport chain, etc., in my biochemistry playlist. So, which one of these is the high energy intermediate? Answer, phosphoenyl pyruvate, or PEP. Remember that glycolysis had many functions, one of which is to give me some intermediates, like these two, who are high energy intermediates, by substrate level phosphorylation, phosphorylation, AT, phosphate, adenosine triphosphate. This is what we mean by substrate level phosphorylation. We use this 
to make energy. And the high energy intermediates of glycolysis include 1 and 3 bisphosphoglycerate as well as phosphoenolpyruvate. Don't forget that as we have said before, glycolysis has three main functions, three intermediates, and three irreversible steps. Question 19. Gluconeogenesis is beneficial during the fasting state. No kidding. Which of the following is true about gluconeogenesis? Is it A, B, C, or D? Choice A, fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate 1 is the rate limiting enzyme. Or it is gluconeogenesis stimulated by adenosine monophosphate. Or gluconeogenesis is stimulated by fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate. Or gluconeogenesis is stimulated by glucagon hormone. Let's talk about that. What's the rate limiting enzyme in gluconeogenesis? Is it fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphatase? No, it's fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase. Is gluconeogenesis stimulated by adenosine monophosphate? No, actually, AMP, adenosine monophosphate, inhibits gluconeogenesis. How about fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate? It also inhibits gluconeogenesis. How about glucagon? Let's think about that. Gluconeogenesis happens in the fasting state, not in the land of abundance, insulin land, but in the land of scarcity, glucagon land. So it makes sense that glucagon acts in its own self-interest and promotes gluconeogenesis during fasting and or starvation. Let's review. Glycolysis goes this way, but gluconeogenesis goes this way. It has many enzymes. The key rate limiting step is fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase. Fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase will break down fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphate. When you break this down, it becomes fructose 6 phosphate. You removed the phosphate group from carbon number 1. So that's why we call it fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase 1. And then you go up glucose 6-phosphate, and then you go up glucose. Don't forget glucose 6-phosphatase, which breaks down glucose 6-phosphate into glucose, because this enzyme is deficient in von Gerke's disease, one of the glycogen storage diseases, and this was a question in one of my previous biochemistry videos. Again, refer to my playlist called MCAT questions to learn more. Let's think about the regulators. Okay, first let me tell you glycolysis because gluconeogenesis is the opposite. Glycolysis, I just ate a meal that contains carbohydrate. Now, if I am fed and happy and have tons of ATP running around, do you think ATP will induce or inhibit glycolysis? Of course, ATP will inhibit glycolysis because if I have too much energy already, why on earth will I burn glucose to make more energy? I wouldn't. So ATP inhibits glycolysis, which means that AMP stimulates glycolysis. If AMP, adenosine monophosphate, stimulates glycolysis, then it's going to inhibit the opposite. It's going to inhibit gluconeogenesis. And that's why choice B was incorrect. Next is the effect of fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate. This doofus right here is brought about by insulin. In the land of abundance, when I'm in the feeding state, which means insulin stimulates the formation of fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate to stimulate glycolysis in the insulin land and inhibit the opposite. It inhibits fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase 1. And that's why choice C was incorrect. As for glucagon, yes indeed. Glucagon is the land of scarcity, the land of fasting and starvation. It stimulates fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase. And it does the opposite over here. It inhibits the formation of this doofus, which is fructose 2 and 6 bisphosphate. Again, all of this was covered in greater detail in my video titled Gluconeogenesis. You will find it in my biochemistry playlist. Question 20. Which of the following letters represent the activation energy in the absence of a catalyst? Is it A or is it B? C or D? Please pause and let me know. Well, activation energy will take me from here to here. This is the energy that I need to add to the reaction to bring it about, to cause it to happen. The benefit of adding an enzyme catalyst is to lower the activation energy so that instead of climbing over all of this, I can just climb over this and go to the same destination from reactants to products. So C represents the activation energy in the absence of a catalyst. D represents the activation energy in the presence of a catalyst. Since they want in the absence, I'm going with C. 
And we have talked about this before in my chemistry playlist. Here is the activation energy in the absence of a catalyst. Without an enzyme, you have to go all the way up, which takes more energy. Catalysts lower the activation energy. You just have to climb this tiny top right here, and then you will reach the same destination. Pay attention, whether you use an enzyme or no enzyme, the overall change of energy, the delta G, does not change because this is the difference between the reactants and the products. Whether I use an enzyme or not, both the origin and the destination did not change, which means the difference between them did not change either. If the question asked you, where is delta H? Delta H is from the bottom until the reactants. Where is the intermediate state? Up here. We have reactants, intermediate, and products. You can refer to my video on equilibrium and kinetics in my chemistry playlist. If you found these videos helpful, please consider supporting my channel by buying me a coffee. You can download my chemistry notes, my biochemistry notes, my biology notes, physiology notes, pulmonology notes, hematology notes, rheumatology notes, all kinds of notes on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. To master your renal physiology, to understand how your kidney works, which will help you pass your exam, download my renal physiology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. There are more than 1,500 free videos on this channel, plus 300 premium videos when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell, support the channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my notes, courses, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.